Hello everybody and welcome to the late session, the last talk before tonight's keynote. It's my pleasure to, um, to do two things this evening. The first is to introduce some excellent speakers, uh, not the Behringer ones behind you, but these ones in front of you. And my second pleasure will be to get out of the way and let them do their stuff. So um, from left to right, which is not the way that my introduction is written, we have um, Andrew McPherson on my left. And I mean, I, I've scripted a biography because I think it's much better than just inventing one. Um, Andrew McPherson is one of those people who seems to manage two strands of a career better than most people can manage one. So first as an academic at Queen Mary University of London, and second as an innovator slash entrepreneur, I think it's fair to say, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, many of you will be aware of the work he did um, a few years ago bringing the prepared piano into the 21st century by introducing electronic resonances and new possibilities for control. Um, you may also know the thing that he's about to introduce today, I think, the Touch Keys project, which we could describe, I think, as a forerunner and contemporary of the seaboard. Um, and, and I'm not going to tell you too much about that because that's what he's one of the reasons he's here today. Um, the second speaker we have um, is Florian Bomas who has been using MIDI for almost as long as it's existed, um, spending his formative years programming what are now called audio and MIDI applications, um, all power to him. An exciting time to be computer literate, I think, the mid-80s, um, when everything was sort of new and happening. Uh, the, first I um, the first thing I know about Florian is that he's the owner of Bohm Software, which these days is also Bohm Hardware, and specializes in solutions for MIDI protocol translation and routing. Um, he spoke earlier today, and, and if you missed his talk, well, you, you missed you missed a very interesting advert and exposition, which is probably worth seeing again. We are, we are kind of YouTubing these. Uh, the second thing that Florian is, um, I know about Florian is that he is a member of the MIDI Technical Standards Board, and I can testify that he's one of the most prolific and helpful forces behind the work, behind the scenes on MIDI's next generation protocol, which is a testament to his stamina and forbearance, I think, after such a, such a long period of time. Um, I've almost been practicing this. Um, the third panelist is um, Emanuela Paravicini, Great. Well, that'll do. Um, I <laughs> wrong, wrong end of Europe for me. Um, is a co-founder of Audio Modeling, creators of the SWAM instruments that offer synthesis of traditional instruments um, with incredible fidelity and control. And these are my words. I'm not reading a press release. Um, they've helped many a Rolly Seaboard video go viral. And it's fair to say that Emanuela, like our other panelists, is at the vanguard of showing what MIDI can do when a flexible MIDI controller is allied with a powerful and expressive synthesis engine. It's kind of what MIDI is all about. Um, and finally, and definitely not least, is um, Tom White, who will be familiar to many people as president and CEO of the MIDI Manufacturers Association. He's um, also worked with other standards bodies, including MPEG and the IEC, to ensure that MIDI continues to reach an ever-increasing panoply of new markets. As part of his responsibilities, Tom consults music and audio companies to help them identify and execute strategies that concern music, audio, and MIDI. He will also be invited to respond if anybody today starts extemporizing about recent drafts from any of the association's working groups. Um, so, our panel. So, my, my job in the MIDI Manufacturers Association is to facilitate brilliant people like this into accomplishing new things, and I'm going to do basically the same job here. I'm here to help facilitate this conversation, and I will also be presenting some of the information myself. So this is the, uh, the basic agenda. Now, I, I want to ask first, how many of you were at the Apple-sponsored session yesterday where Tori talked about MIDI-CI? Okay, so not everybody. That's good. How many of you were at the MIDI-CI introduction last year here at ADC? Okay, not everybody. That's good. So for those of you who were here last year, we are going to um, review that session for those of you who were not here last year which is about a third of you. So I just want to kind of make that clear. If you're thinking, why is he saying that? They said that last year. It's for everybody who didn't raise their hands. Um, and then uh, I want to also start by saying, uh, and I'll cover this a little more detail later on, we're not going to reveal anything that might cause you to change your product plans or schedules today because we're kind of opposed to doing those kind of things until we're committed to having those things happen. So we're very careful not to make announcements about new things that might happen. We only want to tell you about things that are happening. And at the end, when there's a Q&A, if you want to try to um, squeeze more information out of me, you're welcome to do that. But part of my job is to not let you do that. So I just wanted to get that clear. <coughs> OK, so the session agenda, we're going to start talking about, just quickly, MIDI from 1983 to current. And then what we're doing right now, which is MIDI capability inquiry. And we'll talk about that again, the overview from last year. Um, We'll have a MIDI CI case study. 
Uh, then let's talk a little bit about property exchange, which is one of the functions that you can enable through MIDI CI. Uh, a little bit about next generation protocol, and I will try to clarify what that is and what that isn't. A little bit of information about, I call it a case study, but it really isn't. It's we're going to have uh, Andrew talk about what they're doing on touch keys, which is like the MMA next generation protocol, but they're using OSC at the moment. And then we'll talk about action items, what we want you to do, and then hopefully some good Q&A. Okay, so MIDI came out in 1983. It was called the MIDI Specification 1.0, and it, there were two parts to it. One is a transport specification, which everybody knows, the little smiley five pinned in. And the other was the messaging specification, <coughs> which is basically a stream of command and data bytes. What the specification did was define a set of combinations and values for those data bytes and, and status bytes, but it did not define them all. Mu much of it was undefined. What happened over the years is we defined many more messages in the MMA, but the structure is unchanged and still called MIDI 1.0 because it is still MIDI 1.0. We didn't change anything about that. We also created what we call recommended practices. For example, standard MIDI files, which isn't really MIDI 1.0. It's a whole different message structure, but it works with MIDI. General MIDI, which uses MIDI 1.0 messages. MPE, which uses MIDI messages, etc. And as a result, millions of people use MIDI, and they know MIDI, and they identify things by note on, note off, controllers, and all that stuff. So the problem is, as we've added things, we've used up all the available space, and about the only way we can extend anything now is SysX. People know what SysX is? Okay, how many of you love SysX? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So here we are today, and we have this thing called MIDI Capability Inquiry, and it is designed to give us the opportunity to add things to MIDI that we couldn't do before. Unfortunately, it uses SysX because, like I said, that's all that was available. But that's okay you won't really have to see much of that yourselves because all of the ecosystem is going to implement MIDI capability inquiry and then there'll be APIs like Tori talked about. It's all transparent to you. So this is a good time to quickly review what we talked about about MIDI CI last year, uh, which would be Florian's opportunity. Let me see if I can switch over to that. Okay. Uh, so this chart uh, tells us a bit about MIDI CI. Um, so the core of MIDI CI is the, the capabilities inquiry message, which is SysX, um, but it allows you to query your peer to the, the device you're connected to. Um, what can you do? So in general, there are the three Ps, profile configuration, property exchange, and protocol negotiation. Um, and I think I should that's go to the next yes. slide. Yeah, that's them. Yep. Right. So um, right. what we call the three Ps. Um, the first one is profile configuration. A profile is a set of definitions what a device can do. Um, for example, the drawbar organ profile would define there are um, drawbars. Um, maybe there are some certain controllers. What do they do? Which are uh, which of the controllers are defined? Um, but also response to node on, node off, could be defined in such a profile. Um, and um, there are ideas for many other kinds of profiles. Um, but the good thing is a device can expose that via MIDI CI to any anybody who is inquiring and say, "Hey, which profile do you support?" And not only that. Also, you can also ask how many profiles and which profiles do you support? So you can support multiple profiles. So th there can really be a very uh, fine-grained uh, control over profiles, and you can enable and disable them as you like. So um, you may have a, a nice um, synthesizer which has a drawbar organ, but maybe also the the piano profile and then you can activate them maybe even per channel things like that so it's very powerful on a high level view on a more fine grained level there is property ex exchange which allows you to query single properties of uh, the other device so, so you can ask uh, what what is the parameter mapped to uh, controller 15 
or um, which controllers do you support at all, what is the name of that key, um, very fine-grained um, inquiries with property, with a second P, property exchange. Um, yeah, and you can query which proper properties are available, you can set them, and you can get the current value. So also things like units for, uh, for a controller is possible with, with that. Okay, the third P is protocol ne negotiation. So with uh, MIDI CI, you can also ask which protocols do you support? And um, it might be just MIDI 1.0, so you just keep on using MIDI 1.0. But once uh, next generation MIDI is ratified, you can then say, hey, I also support uh, next generation. And you can switch to that protocol and then use the new features of the next generation MIDI protocol. That's it. All right. That's MIDI CI. Okay. Great. All right. So, um, I think that might happen. Yes. Capability inquiry. Sorry, acronyms. We, you know, we're MMA. We love acronyms. Um, so, Emmanuel, please come up and uh, show us what you've been doing with MIDI CI. Uh, As uh, Ben said, uh, maybe you know of the modeling for the Swarm engine, but also we are making a new product that is Camelot, uh, which is uh, going to be released next December 12. And this is an, a case study uh, with the MIDI CI. Mm, let me say that uh, uh, we are happy to be a member of MMA, and uh, I invite any manufacturer company or software company to adhere or anyway if you are not uh, a manufacturer or uh, software developer also to to join the media association so uh, uh, we start from the need of uh, a real um, live performance musician uh, maybe this this picture uh, explain uh, with the problem. You have many devices, many synthesizer. You have uh, some uh, m music sheets uh, or, or score. Uh, you also maybe need to uh, control lights, uh, show, uh, sequences, and so on. And uh, uh, what you, you do now with MIDI, uh, with standard MIDI, you you need to know uh, for each uh, song or each scene of your song, uh, you need to know the uh, bank select, program change, uh, and so on to uh, keep all your devices uh, uh, with the right uh, with the right program, with the right sound to, to be played. And uh, also, you are a musician, and you, did, you need to stay focused on, on what you are doing. You you are performing. So you are not uh, uh, a technician, maybe. Uh, so wha what we are trying to do is uh, a, a product that um, provides a plug-and-play experience. Uh, so uh, to uh, offer the same uh, usability of the, the hardware devices as, as, the, as we are habit with the software plugins. Basically, uh, with the software plugins, uh, you just need to select a patch. You don't know nothing about uh, program change, bank select, and so on, and CZX, and so on. So um, this is the, the first uh, experience. Also, uh, if, you have a, if you are happy with the synthesizer, you know that uh, you are different modes, maybe multi-mode, single mode, and so on, arpeggiator, and, and, s and and also, uh, you need to set uh, uh, hardware settings, like uh, uh, put the synthesizer in local on, off, or uh, configure the transmit and receive channel, and so on. This is, uh, this is a, a screenshot of our, our uh, 
of Camelot, and uh, this part is uh, when when you add a, a new we call item. Uh, in particular, when we uh, add an item that is an hardware instrument, so uh, you select a, a brand of supported instrument. For example, in this case, uh, we select a Yamaha, and uh, you can configure different uh, um, MIDI settings, and you get the patch list from the machine. Select the the patch the patch you need without knowing anything about uh, bank set and program change. And you can also, with, uh, uh, with some uh, devices, we can use CZX to grab the uh, multi-part configuration. So the, the um, in, in this case uh, is a montage with the, uh, the first uh, four part of a multi-part uh, uh, performance with the, the name of, of each part. Also, we can uh, get uh, uh, with CZX the uh, hardware setting of the machine. The problem we, we met in building this uh, software is that any vendor has his specific uh, CZX uh, uh, protocol. So we, we need to uh, study every single uh, mid implementation of of every single uh, devices and uh, also uh, we need to understand to know the architecture of the machine if uh, how many modes he has uh, uh, the, the machine has how many uh, parameters uh, uh, and so on uh, if we will will use uh, the midi ci so we we can have uh, unify the uh, mode to, to get methods and send messages and uh, have an, uh, a unified abstraction to query the machine. And also, we can uh, keep the hardware and, and software in sync. So basically, this is a comparison with just uh, MIDI 1.0. Uh, we, we need to deal with a vendor specific CISX and uh, uh, no have a knowledge of uh, the architecture of the machine and uh, we are out of sync between software and hardware with midi uh, point home plus uh, uh, the midi ci we can have a standardized method to get uh, parameters uh, and uh, to query the machine for for the structure of the machine so the mm, the mode and uh, the parts uh, and also the, lay the layout of the machine and be in sync between uh, uh, software and hardware. Also, we can sub subscribe to parameters, so we, we can get, uh, um, we can know when a parameter changes. So now, uh, as I said, we, we need to, to uh, study the implementation chart of each uh, machine and get support from manufacturer and te test with real devices before we, we talk about this also and uh, uh, make a coding co considering and dealing with, with common and, and device specific features so we cannot have a general um, a general uh, way to implement things uh, with MIDI CI <laughs> code once and uh, for any MIDI CI compatible device uh, and just connect and play because uh, if we all, all the device adhere to the MIDI CI specification, we don't need to study uh, every single implementation of, of every single uh, device, but just uh, uh, we can create uh, on the fly uh, the UX uh, to uh, use the device connected. At the MMA, at the AGM MMA uh, last January, we have uh, uh, shown a, a real prototype uh, with uh, our software in MIDI CI, with a prototype of MIDI CI connected to a montage and get the patch list um, using the, the, the prototype of MIDI CI. Thanks. And you will be able to ask questions of Emanuele in a, in a moment too. 
Okay. Uh, quickly, I'm going to show you a video um, explaining some of the possibilities of property exchange, which is the second P. Uh, it's about a two-minute video, and then uh, we'll have Andrew come up. Assuming this all works. Of course it doesn't work. Switch it, switch it. Okay. Um, the third part, third P, next generation protocol. Um, let me introduce a little bit about that, and then Andrew will come up and show you uh, what he's been doing with touch keys, which again is not next generation protocol. It's using OSC, but he is um, working with other people inside MMA to. Um, develop a pr prototyping system that uses next generation protocol. And then when that is done, then of course he can implement it on touch keys. Um, so next generation protocol, I mentioned in the beginning, MIDI 1.0 is a streaming protocol, status bytes and data bytes. Next generation protocol is a packet-based protocol. Its message structure is not MIDI 1.0, um, although the structure is similar to MIDI over USB. So, um, and that was done intentionally because um, many, many, many products today use MIDI over USB as opposed to 5-bin DIN, and that allows you to reuse, as, as a hardware manufacturer, and even the OS developers uh, can then reuse all that uh, implementation to do this next generation protocol. What's important about it is that it still functions like MIDI. It has the same stuff that MIDI has, but more. So um, familiar, you know, note on, note off, CCs, program changes, all that stuff is the same in this next generation protocol, even though at the lower level, it may the bytes themselves may not look the same, a user would never know the difference. They were just, if you were using next gen protocol, you'd boot up your DAW and all of a sudden you go, oh look, my controllers are all 
16-bit or 32-bit or whatever it is, which I'm not going to tell you. You also get more than 16 channels. You get more controllers. You get higher resolution. You have per note controllers. You have note on with pitch, so you're not limited to the default pitch of MIDI. Uh, you have a second, a, a different, uh, additional articulation parameter and timestamps. These are all things that I can tell you. I will say these are in next generation protocol. When they're coming, exactly what they look like, I will not tell you, but these are definitely coming. I'm pretty confident we're not going to remove any of these. Um, most important, no one is getting rid of their MIDI 1.0 devices. Um, in fact, uh, it's very important to continue making MIDI 1.0 devices because they're going to be cheaper than next generation protocol devices. There's many small MIDI devices that don't need all these extra resolutions and channels and things like that. Um, and people buy MIDI devices and keep them forever. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about MIDI is that anything you made in 1983 still works today unless the electronics failed. Um, so what we have is a part of the definition of next generation protocol is how to do translation in both directions. And um, if you were at the Apple session yesterday, Apple explained how they were going to implement MIDI CI and they will support profiles when they exist. They will support property exchange when those specifications exist and they said they will handle the entire next generation protocol part. So uh, all this, it will be basically transparent. Apple will just handle it. You just ask for something and they will just give it to you. Um, obviously, that's just one solution. We still need to get everybody else on board. Uh, clarification, it is not going to be called next generation protocol. This is a generic name we came up with so that we can talk about it. Uh, the actual name is still TBD. Um, but as uh, Emanuele was saying, and touch keys will show you, th there are companies in the MMA right now who are actually prototyping all of this. CI is already out. It's implemented in Mac, uh, a core MIDI. It's a, beta it's a beta state, but it's in both iOS and uh, Mac OS. Um, but it's, as Tori said yesterday, it's the plumbing for what's coming. So you can't really do much with it because there are no profiles, there's no property exchange spec, and there's no next generation protocol. Um, that said, you could write your own dummies. You could throw some prof profiles in. You could throw some parameter exchange things for prototyping, and that's kind of what we're all trying to do here is we're trying to say it's a good time to join the MMA to do this and start prototyping or work with Apple to do this and start prototyping some things and testing it all out and letting us know how it works. So with that, uh, if Andrew could come up and talk about touch keys. All right, thank you very much. Good, we have sound. Okay, so yeah, my name is Andrew McPherson and I, I'm here wearing two hats, I suppose. Uh, one is as the founder of a small spin-out company called Touch Keys Instruments, which makes a, a product which is a multi-touch keyboard that senses where your fingers are on the keys. I'll show you a brief video in a moment. And then the other is as a researcher and academic at Queen Mary University of London, where I lead a group called the Augmented Instruments Laboratory. We do a lot of development of new musical instruments. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be member of the MMA and to uh, you know have the opportunity to, to share some of my general uh, thoughts on instrument design. I'm just going to show you a brief video about what touch keys is about with apologies that it's a you know it's a short clip of a promotional video so there'll be a bit of narration. <laughs> With touch keys, you can use finger motion to control any aspect of the sound. You can also control traditional instrument sounds, adding characteristic techniques. With, uh, with apologies for the, the incredible latency on the video system, that is not a feature of touch keys specifically. Um, 
It would be a negative latency, in fact, because the sound, pr yes, or MIDI, for that matter. Um, so yeah, th this, is, uh, this is one project that came out of uh, my work at the Augmented Instruments Laboratory, which is a team of about, uh, about 10 people that uh, I lead at Queen Mary. And we make all sorts of different instruments. Uh, one theme of our work is augmenting traditional familiar instruments with new capabilities where, you know, and I think that here, being able to uh, extend the nuance and resolution of, of instruments is some a place where uh, the next generation protocol will really excel. Uh, we are particularly interested in notions of, uh, of subtlety, uh, of what's sometimes called control intimacy, in the, which is a term from David Wessel, who's one of the sort of great pioneers of digital musical instrument research, uh, and then also things like, uh, like low latency, high timing precision. So um, I, have I have to be honest that in, the, uh, in our current work, we, we don't use MIDI 1.0 all that much, and uh, it, it's a perfectly wonderful specification, um, but I think it's also worth kind of remembering uh, some some of the kind of origins of it, which of course is that a, a lot of this came from the, the notion of what a piano does, and uh, you know, a piano, the acoustic piano, is one where when you press a key, you have hammers that, uh, that strike the strings, and so it's natural to have a discrete series of notes, to have a velocity, which is the literal velocity with which the hammer strikes the string, and then maybe to have some continuous controllers like pedals that you might use to, to modulate the sound. And so, you know, viewed from that perspective, I think, you know, the kind of traditional sort of 1983 status of MIDI comes into, you know, comes into focus. You have note on, note off, you have a seven bit velocity number. Uh, that is most of the information that you have about the articulation of a note. Uh, and you have some channel wide controls that will, you know, potentially have 14 bit resolution if you have it, you know, set up correctly. But, uh, you know, th there are certain limitations that I think uh, most people, certainly on this panel and in this room, are aware of. Um, uh, my point with touch keys was essentially that it's really important that there are millions of people who understand how to play the keyboard, um, but they want to use keyboards potentially to control all manner of different sounds, but without essentially restricting the range of expression of those sounds to the kinds of techniques that are natural to the keyboard. So I'm a viola player myself, and uh, you know, I'm particularly interested in the kind of nuance that you can get with a bow, not just in terms of modulating the sound after the fact or playing vibrato, those, though those are very important, but also the kinds of articulations that you could have at note onset. It's it's a different it's a different way of thinking about uh, about notes than uh, than on the keyboard, and so uh, the goal of touch keys is effectively to try to bring as many of these things as possible into a familiar keyboard context, so that it's an instrument you already know how to play, but it's also more than that. Um, technically speaking. Uh, that the, the technology is capacitive touch sensing. Uh, each key, there's a sensor that goes on each key. It measures where you place your finger, and it also measures the contact area of your touch. Uh, so that's X, Y position sensing with contact area. Uh, you can have three fingers on the same key at the same time, which can be useful in certain situations. And the resolution is quite high. Uh, you know, in particular, the spatial resolution is about 1,500 points on the long axis of the key for the black keys and 2,500 for the white keys. And so that's significantly higher than uh, seven bits. Um, that brings me essentially to, you know, to some of the things that I'm very excited about uh, with the, uh, the next generation protocol. And just to confirm, this is, this is not a description of what the next generation protocol will be. This is my sort of uh, personal take as an instrument designer of the things that I think are, are important and which to a certain extent can be kind of shoehorned into MIDI 1, but that, you know, where I think that uh, future development really can unlock a lot of possibilities. Um, Higher control resolution in some ways is a very obvious point. Uh, you know, if I have 1,500 or 2,500 point resolution on a particular key, then it's awfully useful not to have to compress that into seven bits beforehand or, you know, to come up with kind of predetermined mappings that decide which bit of that is the, is the most important data to preserve. Um, the uh, multi-dimensional control per note is, of course, extremely important and one where, uh, e I, you know, I don't pretend that touch keys is the only controller on the market that uh, you know that offers multi-dimensional control, right? I mean, this is a huge area. It's an incredibly exciting area. I mean, amazing, you know, amazing products. You know, the the seaboard, the instrument. I mean, we can you know we can go on, um, but. Uh, to be able to have a native way of expressing multi-dimensional control on each note and each key will be very, very useful. And in the case of touch keys, that could involve, you know, X, Y, touch area, multiple touches on the keys. We can do some of this within MPE right now uh, at the cost potentially of polyphony in that we're using a channel for every note. So, you know, if we have 16 MIDI channels available, that implies that we have 16 notes at a time. 
okay, maybe that's great. We have ten fingers, but you know, with if this is in the context of a piano, the minute you press the pedal down, you might suddenly have dozens of notes that might be subtly sounding, and so there's you know there's an opportunity here. Um, as I said earlier, articulation is an area that interests me greatly uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the ability to specify what an onset sounds like by something more than its velocity. And I think that, that you know, this is an area where there's potential for some very exciting developments. Um, and then, you know, to be able to use that also for uh, specific effects like scoops or buzzes or falls. Um, uh, the point is that right now a lot of this stuff can work in MIDI, but you kind of have to hack it a little bit. You have to slightly shoehorn things in and use controls in ways that maybe they weren't originally anticipated to, to do. And, uh, and I think, you know, like uh, Capability Inquiry is a, is a really good way of sorting some of this out. But, you know, better still is to just, you know, kind of straightforwardly have all this information there. I'll show you one final short video to show you another possible opportunity. Um, it, one thing we could do with touch keys is to split the keys into regions, so instead of having 12 notes per octave, you have 24. Uh, this is a short uh, example of some Turkish makam tunings by a composer in Istanbul named Ozan Yarman. Um, and a, as you'll see, the, you know, the, the tuning switches throughout this short excerpt. <laughs> So, um, of course, uh, and this is, this is my final slide, uh, that e being able to control the individual tuning of each note would be quite valuable in non-Western contexts, non-equal tempered contexts, uh, microtonal contexts. Um, we can do some of that with pitch wheel messages, as I'm doing right now. Uh, some things I'm doing using OSC, uh, I but of course, e synths tend to have certain assumptions about what the pitch wheel means. There's no guarantee that you have a linear mapping, for instance, from pitch wheel value to actual pitch, such that getting that tuning to be exactly precise in output is not a guarantee. You might have situations where you send a message and it actually glides there over a short period of time, which might not be suitable in all cases. So, um, you know, right now I've done a lot of work with OSC as a way of, you know, not having these resolution limitations, but of course the problem there is interoperability. There's no universal OSC spec that every instrument speaks. So uh, all of this is just to say that I'm extremely excited about where uh, where things are going in, in MIDI land, and uh, yeah, really happy to be part of the conversation. Thank you. the point of all this? The point is to let you know that there are things happening, why they might be happening, what the advantage, what the point of trying to do MIDI CI profile property scheme estimation protocol, and let you know that we are doing it. Uh, we need more people to help test and build and find bugs, just like everybody does. Um, we would like those of you who uh, are in qualification for joining the MMA, which is building something that uses MIDI, and put the most appropriate people, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, if you join, you'll get early access to this work. You don't have to actually do anything. You could just get early access and make jokes about it among your friends, as long as you don't just tell them anything confidential. Or you could actually help us, um, give us some feedback, uh, do some prototyping. Um, another thing you could do, and, and Manuel mentioned this in the beginning, is 
The, besides the MIDI, associate, uh, MIDI Manufacturer Association, we have another thing which we call the MIDI Association. It's very confusing and very similar. Um, but it's a way to uh, be part of the industry of MIDI without being an MMA member, which costs money and requires confidentiality and all that. So, um, <coughs> As a MIDI Association member, which is free, uh, you can get updates and information from us, and we're working very hard to try to target, I say you, actually anybody can, but we were working on figuring out something specifically to do with developers, so maybe we could, um, can't necessarily tell you a lot, but you could at least tell us a lot of things somewhere quietly and privately. Um, <coughs> so again, quickly, the MMA is where developers collaborate on specifications, make many products operate, discussions are confidential, decisions are made by consensus. Um, and anyone who makes commercially available product can join. TMA, or the MIDI Association, is the global community for anyone who works to play the MIDI. Membership is free. Members can, that's where you get the specs. You can post in forums. And we're trying to work out some way that we can interface a little bit more directly with developers. Um, more on that, I guess what I'm saying is what we're looking for on the developer side of the, of the MIDI Association, or TMA, is you could contact us and tell us what you want. The difference between doing that and doing that that way in, in the MMA is in the MMA, you actually would have a voice on what you just said, whereas in the TMA, we would listen to you and go, we could say, that's very nice, go away. Um, but I think we would like to hear from you. The, 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 again, the point I'm trying to make is when you join MMA, first it costs money, and second of all, you're somewhat committing to uh, do some work, otherwise there's almost no point. Uh, and if instead you're just thinking, I just like to be able to tell people what to do, and I don't want to have to do anything, then join the TMA and use that as your mechanism to tell us what you might want to do. And the worst that could happen is we just won't implement anything that you said. <laughs> so, uh, MIDI.org is the global, it's both TMA and MMA. Specifications, including MIDI CI, is at this MIDI.org specifications uh, URL. Uh, if you want to find out more about the MMA itself, there's a special URL, midi.org, about the MMA. Um, and I am involved in both organizations, and info at midi.org comes to me. So if you can't remember anything, just remember info at midi.org, and you can always just email me and say, uh, you were the guy at the ADC conference, and you said something, and I want to find out what that is. Okay, so with that, I think this is probably going to be the most important part. What kind of questions do you have that we can answer? I think we're about seven minutes before we have to get to the Zoom meeting. So. <laughs> All right, I'll do the um, couple of ones around here. Maybe. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it looks really good what you're coming up with, so I'm excited to see the future. Um, for MIDI CI, one area that isn't very clear to me is how it's meant to work if I'm a plugin in a host. So if I'm a plugin in a door, I'm going to get buffers of MIDI information. I don't know what the device is. I don't necessarily have a channel to speak to it. Um, so it hasn't been very clear to me of w what's the intention there. Yes. So um, what would typically happen, and, and Tori from Apple explained this on his platform yesterday, is as a plugin, you would have to be MIDI CI aware. And when you are instantiated or whatever it's called on a, on a Mac or iOS, um, you would tell Apple there's an API. And you say, by the way, I'm MIDI CI aware. And Apple goes, thank you very much. I will take care of that for you. And then whatever you need to know, you just say to Apple, uh, can you please tell me, are there any drawbar organs out there? Or is there any whatever? And Apple takes care of all that. I guess the thing that I wonder about is uh, my MIDI my MIDI buffer is coming through the door, and I don't know if that's attached to a device, if it's attached to the recording. So if I'm talking to a separate API through Apple about the devices attached, how do I know how that links up with there's the buffers I'm seeing? The session management, and app, again, this is on Apple platforms, and I probably should let them explain it, but they handle the session management for you. You say who you, they tell, they expose to you all the other MIDI CI devices that you are, or with the ones you query about. And then you tell Apple, yes, I want to connect to that one. And Apple takes care of that from then on. Now, that's how Apple does it. There may be other implementations and other platforms. Um, so let's say I have a device that receives MIDI 1 right now. Um, if you send, if some device sends MIDI CI, 
Will that include MIDI one? So note on note of and program change, and then the MIDI CI I, I will not receive or something like this. It it will it be compatible. This so, is so. Um, what happens with MIDI CI b before any of this other stuff? Before you can configure a pr you know, query a profile or set a property or decide you want to do anything, the first thing you say is, "Do you do MIDI CI?" And if you get no answer, then you don't do any of these three things we just said. Okay, so I, it will just receive the usual MIDI one. It's exactly. You just go, well, it doesn't do MIDI CI. I guess I'll just do everything that was in MIDI 1.0 before MIDI CI. Okay. Um, how is it managed if I hook up several MIDI devices, MIDI chain together with MIDI through maybe, and um, then this MIDI CI negotiation happens that several devices can uh, identify themselves, or how is it handled? Uh, that's session management issue, right? No? Florian, Florian's going to answer that for you. <laughs> the assumption is that you just don't do that. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> I <laughs> think it is actually in, in the CI spec that um, for now it just works if you have like a peer-to-peer -peer MIDI connection, bidirectional MIDI connection. That's the, uh, not an assumption, but the requirement, really. And in the, uh, in the use case that you show, there were um, five or four synths together, and they will be um, hooked just with a door, and don't and uh, not um, no right. direct yes. connection between the synths. Right. So, so there is an inquiry ID. So it is possible to separate different um, uh, inquiries, and but. So yes, I, I, I think it'll work, um, but it's just not specified right now. Um, yeah, I think MIDI CI is you know, great, and I think one th one question I've got that's following on sort of, sort of from door door uses, um, you know, a lot of what we were talking about then was sort of instrument to you know or controller to instrument, where you know I'm in the industry of piece of hardware that is uh, is half instrument, half door controller, and uh, and I feel like you know one of the biggest challenges we have often is um, okay, I want to integrate integrate into the logic into Ableton into Bitwig. Which is a challenge because it means you know talking to each individual um, company developer at a time. You know we could I you know look at doing sort of Mackey control to to standardize that, but it feels to me that this is the perfect thing to really go. Okay, well look, we have this piece of hardware. It can be either a, a, a door controller or an instrument. It's automatically just going to work. And like you know, is there enough conversation actually happening with you know more than just Apple you know, about thi this door integration? Because I think this is the the killer thing that's really going to sort of Excel this. So, so my answer is, if there was enough conversation going on, we probably wouldn't be here, <laughs> right? Because we typically don't talk to people until we're done, and yet we're here talking to people before we're done. And it's because no, we need people to come in and say, "Hey, I need a profile. I need a Mackie controller profile." And we go, "Great, then let's go work on it." The problem is, you can't. And I alluded to this earlier. You could go to the TMA. And send me an email and say I need a Mackie and I'll go great, thanks very much. And I'll tell the TMA, uh, the MMA board, and they'll go, yeah, well, tell that guy to join the MMA and do the work. So that's what it comes down to. It's a collaborative environment. Companies join so that they can work with other companies. Every single profile you can imagine is probably desirable, but the ones we're going to do are the ones that people show up to do. So I better join them. <laughs> yes, the last one I think, right? I think so. Yes. And then we can kind of close the session and
you can uh, molest the panelists yourself. I, uh, sorry, I, asked, I kind of asked this question to Florian earlier, and I, I think I, I want to rephrase it in, in, a, in a, to a, the wider panel. Um, so MIDI 1.0 just works, right? You get two devices that work. Uh, with these profiles, you may have a drawbar organ, and then you may have some sort of synthesizer. And you, this, it's, as I understand, there's no straightforward way of remapping those drawbars to controlling something else. More, more in general, uh, uh, more in general, are we gonna end up with a number of different profiles that are basically completely incompatible to each other uh, at the um, next gen level, and they will just go back to default to 1.0 specifications? Not if we do it correctly. Um, th th so. The assumption is you have a profile when there is already out in the marketplace some consistent, repeatable device definition. Uh, draw bar organ, we chose that because, and that's really not a good one because there are seven bar ones and there's eight bar ones and nine, but we're pretending that they don't, ex that's not what happens. We're pretending that it's like all draw bar organs are the same. And maybe you just say nine and then you, maybe there's not. Maybe it's the draw bar organ is a nine draw bars and then use a property exchange to say, by the way, how many draw bars do you actually have? So draw the property exchange gives you the ability to change the profile, right? So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just I'm just concerned that it's it's then up to the DAW or to Apple or to whoever to implement all these things, and and implement yeah. all the possible cases. Whereas just now you know things just work because it's all one set of things to implement. All Apple has to implement is CI. Right, then it's up but to the DAW and yes, plugin exactly developers exactly to deal with DAW, all these if different the devices. If the wants to support these things and have a GUI or anything else, then, then they have to support that. And that's, that's just like it is with MIDI 1.0. I mean, not everybody supports everything in MIDI 1.0 either. So, But that's the whole point of a profile. So you don't go, well, I have a 9 and you have an 8 and you have a 7 and I have a 6 and I use that. So that you try to shift people to use the profile instead of doing custom work. But if you want custom work, you can take that profile and then use a PE thing to change it. So uh, yes, I, I think I, I want to stress what uh, Tom just said. Uh, there are MIDI controllers that only send control change, and there are MIDI receivers that only receive or react to note-on messages. So those, <coughs> although both devices are MIDI, they don't really work together. So um, that will be the same with, with the next generation protocol and with uh, profiles. However, with profiles and with property exchange, you can find out that this is a controller that only sends control change. It, it's, a, it's the I'm only control change sender profile. And the other device, so the, the devices will say, hey, you're connecting to a device that doesn't work with me. Please connect something else. So uh, interoperability will be the same but um, you will know about it. The devices will know about it. So I think that's, uh, that's a big improvement. Thank you, yes. We've got about six minutes to get upstairs, so thank you very much.